Memory verse. I know we know this one. This was easy. First Timothy chapter four, verse 12. I can see it in their eyes. Let's come on, John. You can feel it. He's like, I got this one. Come on. Out loud for the, for the, say with your chest. Come on, boy. Okay. Okay, I wish I had something to give you. All right, here. You got, you got communion cup? All right, let's read it together if you don't know it. Don't let anyone look down on you because you are young, but set an example for the believers in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, and in purity. As you know, Timothy was a young man. He was a young guy, young leader, young pastor. When I came back to Pittsburgh, I was 39, and the members were all significantly older than me, other than the one teenager. And so in my conversations, even with Aunt Liv and my grandmother, it was like, well, how do you lead people who almost, some of whom literally changed your diaper, right? That was tough. And so this, this verse has special meaning for me. Now I'm not as young as I used to be, still kind of young. But it says, don't let anyone look down on you because you're young. And so for those of you who even are young people, if you think you're young, that's fine. Listen, as leaders, if God has called you to lead, don't allow your age to give you fear, anxiety, trepidation, or concern. Right? Because we're talking about this idea of anxiety. We're talking about fear. He says, listen, instead of you being afraid, you set the example. You be the one to follow. You be the trailblazer. In speech, the words that come out of your mouth. In conduct, that's your lifestyle. Right? In your faith, the way that you believe and trust God. In purity, the way you carry yourself in a pure and godly way. And so the Bible is full of instruction and direction for us as we wrestle with trying to get our minds right. And that's the conversation we've been having. So we've been talking about grow up. God wants us to be mature. I promise I'm going to finish this week. We've been on this same message for like three months. The same one and not even a different. But anyway. All right. So issues of anxiety, depression, stress, very common in our world today. We have a basic uh, framework, a model that's guiding our thinking. Very good. So events, circumstances impact our thoughts. Things happen in the world. It causes us to think something. Our thoughts then impact our feelings, our emotions. Something happens, I feel a particular way. Our emotions and feelings impact our actions, which then creates this cycle and it's back to our thoughts, right? So as we think about something happens, so somebody runs into my car. That's the event. I have a thought. I'm going to do something bad to that person. Who said yes, Lord? <laughs> It was just an example. I was just kidding, right? I feel, ang well, I'm, I'm going to say you because I don't feel the way. You feel angry? We're just going to work with the example. Now you're going to jump out your car acting all unseemly. Mm. And they're going to say, you're a member of New Mount Moriah Missionary Baptist Church and not Bible Center, correct? And you're going to be like, amen. See, now, for me, I'd be like, Lord, somebody just hit your car. We got insurance. We got AAA. You must want me to have another car. <laughs> or you're teaching me something here. So it's like, okay, God, I trust you. And I look around and I say, are you okay, person who hit me? Then I ask myself, am I okay? And then my hands go up and I say, thank you, God, that I'm healthy and safe and strong and insured. Amen. Amen. In Jesus' name. Now, for those of us in Bible Center, we know we have a new ministry that we're working not only here in Bible Center, but with other churches around the region, putting um, social workers in churches to help provide resources and access to opportunity and make people aware of things that if life and when life perhaps get overwhelming or folks need food or clothes or whatever, we want to be able to help. And so we call that the chapel project. project. And sister, raise your hand, Sister um, Linda, if people don't know you, please see Linda. Uh, you can give some applause, I guess. <laughs> Making Linda feel good, that's good. All right, so now you know how we do. Let's pray, and then we'll go into it. Father, in the name of Jesus, we give you thanks. God, I'm excited to have the opportunity to share this word with your people today. 
Lord God, I ask that you open up our hearts and minds. You say in your word, Lord God, and I love in Acts where it says you opened up their minds to understand the scriptures. And so God, open up our minds to understand the scriptures and then open up our hearts to be responsive. As, prayer, as Paul prayed, God, give us the spirit of revelation that we may have wisdom and know you better. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right, so kingdom keywords. So in order to kind of understand what we're talking about, try to lay out some keywords so you, you know where we're going. We talked about this already. The first one's maturity, to be like Christ, to grow up, to be like Christ. The second one was peace. Peace, a state of inner tranquility, freedom from disquieting or oppressive thoughts. This is all review, so I'm going to move quickly. If you need to, you take a picture and uh, take care of your notes later. Core beliefs, thoughts, assumptions, ideas that we have about ourselves, other people, God, and the world around us. They're deep-seated and help to drive our thoughts, feelings, and our actions. Common core beliefs, things that people are carrying around in the world. I'm worthless. I'm unattractive. I can't ask for help. I'll never amount to anything. And these things often begin in childhood and parents and family members and Miss McGillicuddy in third grade and your evil cousin and your brothers and sisters. People instill things in us and repeat things. And when we are children, we are particularly receptive to these messages. And because we have an enemy, he attempts to distort, distract, and uh, pervert our thinking while we're little. Because he knows that God has an assignment, a purpose for our lives. And whatever he can do to abort that, he will attempt to do. And so when you think about the messages and if any of these apply to you, you have to ask yourself, well, where did that come from? And refuse to allow the enemy to allow those things to pop back into your head. And we'll talk about that in just a second. As citizens of the kingdom, we should have what? Kingdom core beliefs. Core beliefs that are aligned with the truth of the scriptures. I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Even in my difficulty, all things work together for the good, to them who love God, who are called according to his purpose. I am more than a conqueror. I am super, super extraordinary, right? Because when we understand who we are and whose we are, and our core beliefs are informed by who God says we are, it changes everything. Next kingdom keyword. Ants, automatic negative thoughts, those things that pop into our heads, unfortunately, because often of our socialization or the negative things that happen in our life, always or never things. People always are mean to me. Nobody helps me. I'm this. I'm that. Focusing on the negative. Something happens, and automatically, we jump to the negative. I told you when I gave uh, the example a few weeks ago about my computer being missing. Right? It's like, oh, Lord, somebody stole my computer, stole my identity, and now I, I, you know, my social security number's on the internet, and all of these things, and none of that was true. The computer was where I left it, not where I thought it was. Right? Fortune telling. Something that, well, you know what's going to happen. It's like, no, you don't. I don't either. But fortune telling, saying, well, th this happened, so therefore this is going to happen, this is going to happen, and then I'm going to die. Right? P listen, in the, that, that, that cursed website, WebMD. I know doctors hate WebMD. Please, <laughs> please stop coming in here with a 12-page analysis of what you got. It's a pimple. It is not a cancerous lesion, and you're not about to die tomorrow. Pop that joker and keep it moving. It's hot water, squeeze it, and keep it moving. Blaming. Everything, it, is, it was... I, yeah, I know, I, well, the, the cops stopped me. I was doing 125 mile hour zone, but still, you know how those police are. Like, what? Blaming. All right, OFAs, I just made this one up. Opportunities for anxiety. Opportunities for anxiety. Those are simply events, circumstances. So let's go to the revised model. Opportunity for adversity comes. We go into automatic negative thinking. We have core beliefs that are misaligned with the word of God. We have anxious feelings. We do anxious behaving things. And it starts all over again. And we feed the ants. And they multiply. Now here's the problem. The mental impact, the impact of stress and anxiety. We talked about the ants. 
thought biases. We talked about those things already. So when we are stressed and we allow the enemy to give our thinking misalignment with the word of God, we have anxiety. And then we get stressed. And then we have the physical impacts, right? Fight, flight, or freeze. Either I want to fight you. just depends on your nature. Somebody says something. Somebody does something. You get stressed. Immediately you go into fight or run or just frozen, just stuck. What happens? Your heart rate goes up. Tension in your neck. You get stressed. And you, get to, you ever get that tension to ride all up your back and hit you right here in the head? You ever feel it coming on? That's the crazy part where you actually can feel the thing. You're like, yeah. Right? You start breathing. Stomach starts hurting. Can't sleep. All of these things happen when we experience stress and anxiety. And the issue is our, it begins with our thinking. Opportunity for anxiety and our thoughts. So the sermon and the sentence this morning is still the same. No God, no peace. When we know God, we can know peace. 2 Thessalonians chapter 13, chapter 3, I'm sorry, verse 16 in the Amplified. Now may the Lord of peace, Lord means master, may the master of peace himself grant you his peace. God's peace, not the world's peace, but grant you his peace, that peace that comes from him. At all times, all the time. In every way. That peace and spiritual well-being that comes to those who walk with him regardless. And this is the one I like. Regardless of life circumstances, we can experience God's peace. The Lord be with you all. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 9 and 10. We read this uh, last week and the week before. I'm going to read it again. Indeed, we felt... So Paul says, in light of everything that was going on, what I was thinking, as a result of that, I felt like I had received the sentence of death. I felt like I was going to die. But, but always a big word, right? Erases everything that was in front of it. But this happened. The reason that this happened is that we, he was talking about the royal we, I, might not rely on ourselves, instead rely on God. He says, I thought I was dead. His thinking was, I'm not going to make it. He felt like he was going to die. And he says, the reason God allows us to go through things that overwhelm us. And again, we stop saying that nonsense. It is not biblical that God won't put more on you can bear, right? We don't say that. That's not biblical. It's inaccurate. He says, in fact, the reason that God allowed this stuff to happen is that I would depend on him. Verse 10, he has delivered us, I love this, past tense. He delivered us from such a deadly peril. He says, we were going through this, and God released us. He delivered us. And then he says, and guess what? He'll do it again. And then he says, guess what? And he will continue to do it. He did it, he'll do it again, and he'll continue to do it. Why? Because I understand now, I went through that. And I love the thing about Paul, he's like, oh, I learned the lesson. He's like, I don't have to keep going through this same thing again. I understand now. And so I know that he delivered me. I can look back. Can you look back over your life and see where God delivered you? And did he ever deliver you again? And so he's saying, listen, you see Paul's faith escalating. You know, when you were, when you were tired, when you were overwhelmed, when you wanted to throw in the towel, when you wanted to run. Anybody ever wanted to run? Anybody ever run? <laughs> messing like, yeah, I want to run. Your mama messing with you. Makes you want to run. <laughs> right? Life makes you want to run something. I wanted to run. He says, but listen, when I reflect on what God did for me in the past, and I think about what he's doing for me right now, then I know with confidence that he'll do it. So five ways to experience God's peace. That was cool, but then I said, really, how to overcome our offers and exterminate our ants? Five ways. Now, don't y'all be out here preaching this. I checked the internet. Yeah, I'm wet my jacket. All right, so here's the revised model. Okay, Holly. 
that time? Opportunities for anxiety, thoughts, core beliefs. You see, this is how we should, this is how the model should apply to us as believers. If we have kingdom core beliefs, our thoughts, our feelings, and our actions are all then uh, surrendered to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit guides our thinking, and our whole life is very different. So now, first principle, fix our focus and faith on God, not on our opportunities for anxiety. Isaiah 26 and 3. He says, you keep him in what? All right, let's read this together. You keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts you. He says, not only just peace, but he says, you keep the person in perfect peace. Perfect peace whose mind, right? And we have to fix our minds. Our, our thinking should not just be allowed to do what it does. But he says, if you fix your mind, if you keep your mind stated, stayed, stated, well, stayed on him, and you trust him, because that's an evidence of trusting him. He said, trust, this word means to lean on, to lay back on, to lounge, if you will. He says, if you trust him, he will keep you in perfect peace. What a promise. So if you find yourself all disheveled and this life is just crazy, I encourage you, keep your mind stayed on him because he trusts. Psalm 56 and 3. David says, when I am afraid, it's not that I'm never afraid. I get afraid. You get afraid? Everybody gets afraid. He says, but when I get afraid, what do I do? I put my trust in you. God, when I get afraid, when, th when things happen, stuff pops up in life. When I'm inclined to want to run, scream, my thinking wants to go crazy. It wants to hit my emotions in a strange way. I think something or I see something. I get afraid. But he says, guess what? I stop it right there. And I put my trust in you. Psalm 112, verses 6 through 8. Surely the righteous will never be shaken. You ever say you've been shook? <laughs> like I was shook. He says the righteous, those who are in right relationship with God, whose mind is focused, in, says the righteous will never be shaken. Not that you won't get shook, but you won't stay shaken. You ever been shaken and stirred? <laughs> Verse 7. They have no fear of bad news. He says the righteous people whose mind has stayed on him, they have no fear of bad news. Because here, just because it's news doesn't make this true. Isn't that true? <laughs> so it says they won't have any fear of bad news. Their hearts are steadfast. They trust. There's that key word again. They trust in the Lord. Their hearts are secure. They will have no fear. In the end, they will look in triumph on their foes. And so it's so important that we take the word of God, not the word of people, not the word of mom and them, not even the word of the pastor. But the idea is, what does God say? He says, we won't be shaken. We won't be afraid. Anybody ever been in the tunnels, the Squirrel Hill Tunnel? Anybody ever been stuck in the Squirrel Hill Tunnel? Anybody ever come in east, going west? And traffic backs all the way up, seem like the Monroeville. And you're like, man, there must be a bad accident somewhere. And you creep and creep and creep and walk and get out. And people walking past you, people on their bikes pedaling past you, and you sitting in traffic for hours, right? And then you get through the underside of the tunnel. Yeah, right. And you're like, what happened? But what happens is people get in tunnel, and I guess it's claustrophobic or something, but what they begin to do is focus on the wall. You want to know how to have an accident? <laughs> focus on the wall. I don't want to hit that wall. Who that wall sure is close to me. Man, I'm scared of that wall. And instead of focusing on a point in the future, or even at least the car in front of you that's not smashed into the wall, look into the future and focus 
on something other than the wall. Because listen, your focus is your future. Where you focus your energy, where you focus your thinking, is your, if you're thinking, I'm going to hit the wall, I'm going to hit the wall. I was riding my bike. Or actually, me and my cousins, we were riding bikes, riding down from Rona Road. And so I'm on the side, and I'm looking at the gravel, and I'm looking at the creek. And I'm looking at the gravel, and I'm looking at the creek looking at the road a little bit, and I'm thinking to myself, thoughts, I'm going to hit this gravel. If I hit this gravel, I'm going to get balled up. My thinking affected my feelings, and then my feelings affected my actions. So now I'm swerving. And you know what happened. I got balled up. I went over the handlebars, I just remember looking up. No, you know, this is pre-helmet. We didn't do helmet. Anybody helmets? We didn't know helmets. Cool people don't wear helmets. I don't think they had helmets, actually. <laughs> and so I just went, remember looking up, and my cousin's looking over me. Man, we thought you was dead. <laughs> because why? I was focused. Instead of on the road, I was focused on the gravel and then going into the creek. And so <laughs> it's funny, but not. If you're focused on something, right, I'm focused on, here's the thing, Let's, you, you, you're, having, you're having troubles in your, with your children. This child is going to go wild, and they're going to end up in prison. And, all, and if that's where your focus is, as opposed to, let me develop and, and work on my relationship with the child. So, because your future is your focus. Your future is your focus. So if you're focused, you got two paths. You're focused on the bad thing, and there's another option. You pick which one, but whichever one you're focusing on is going to be your future. And so you're dealing with something right now, and you're trying to make a decision. But you can't. Multitasking doesn't work. The research is very clear. Essentially, you stop thinking about one thing, and you shift to something else. Now, you may feel like you can multitask. I could check my email and listen and all of that. Not really. You ever been, you're on Zoom and you're, you're uh, doing your thing, you, you're do checking your email. Anybody ever check the email on Zoom? It's just me. Okay, all right, got a little honesty. Yeah, okay, right. Fantastic. So I know what's going on during them Zoom meetings for the church. Yeah, and so then somebody calls your name. Well, you say, oh, wait, I didn't quite hear you. No, when you lied. I really wasn't paying attention to you as what the truth was, <laughs> right? Like, oops, got caught. But you can only focus on one thing. And not. So either you're going to focus on what God says or you're going to focus on what the enemy is saying. Number two, reset our mindset on our king and his kingdom. I call this automatic kingdom thinking. Whew. Second, 1 Corinthians 2.16, for who has known the mind of the Lord so as to instruct him? This is one of the most powerful passages in Scripture. But we have the mind of Christ. But we have the mind, the mindset. We have access to the mind of the Creator. So what that means is, whenever things happen in Christ's life, what happens? Automatic kingdom thinking. And that's what it means when we talk about having your mind transformed, that you automatically think the things of the kingdom and not the things of the enemy. Automatic kingdom that's our aspiration. That is our goal as Christ followers, that our mind gets reframed such that whenever anything happens, an opportunity for anxiety, whenever it arises, what happens? Automatic kingdom thinking. That's what I, every week, this is what I'm trying to do here, to get myself and to get us thinking through the lens of the mind of Christ, the kingdom of God mindset. Second verse, Colossians 3 and 2. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. Because if you're focused on the earth and the earth system and the earth's way of doing things, 2008, there's a massive problem in terms of our real estate market. There's a, a, a I don't know if it was full on depression, but it certainly was a recession. And things were bad. 
And so you had people literally killing themselves because of that. We're seeing now life expectancy in the United States of America has actually declined because of, they call it um, deaths of distress, deaths of despair. Substance use is higher than ever before. People are drinking, smoking, fentanyling themselves to death. Committing suicide. All these things. Why? Because the stress, the anxiety, and the mindset that is not the mind of Christ. And people are setting their minds on earthly things. There was no recession in the kingdom of God. There was no financial challenges in the kingdom of God. Everybody in this room, did anybody go homeless during the recession? At least nobody in here, right? Even if you had to move in with mom and them, whatever. The point was, God brought us through. And so the thing is to focus on things above, not on earthly things. Romans chapter 12, 2. You know, I know when people are listening to the sermon, they're like, well, why don't he use this verse? I do that. You ever think, why don't he use this verse? Is that just me? That's just me and other people who are students of the scriptures. Oh, you. <laughs> right? Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing to make new of your mind, of your mind. And then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is. What is God's will? His kingdom come, his will being done on earth as it is in heaven. Do not conform, do not allow your mind to be in the cookie cutter of the world. The world's way of thinking, the world's way of doing. Your truth, our truth, my truth, y'all's truth. There is truth, the truth is God's truth. Got a period and an amen, thank you. His good, pleasing, and perfect will, his desire, his intention, his want. Philippians chapter 3, verse 18 through 20. For I, as I have often told you before and now tell you again, even with tears, many people live as enemies of the cross of Christ. See, either you're a friend or an enemy. That's the way it works. If you're not a citizen of the kingdom of God, you're a citizen of the kingdom of darkness. He says, so many people live as enemies of the cross. But notice, Paul is not happy about this. Paul is hurting. He says, through tears, I see people who are distant, disconnected from God. His heart is broken, not sinners. You're on your way to hell. You know, you, there are Christians who act like they're happy about the fact that people that don't, God, don't know God. And Paul's like, are you kidding me? I have tears. He says, their destiny is destruction. Their God is their appetites, their wants, and their glory. The things that they're happy about, the things that they experience glory, the, the reason they're popular, why they have followers, is their shame. What's the problem? Their mind is set on earthly things. But what? Our citizenship is where? Because we eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord, Master, Jesus, Savior, Christ, King. He says, we're citizens. We're from another place. And so we think differently. Our country governs our thinking. The constitution of our kingdom tells us how to live. When we see crises, we see difficulties. We say, what does God say? Not does, what do people say? And so Paul's heart is broken that there are people who do not know God. Number three, we fight fake facts and arrest our runaway thoughts. The weapons we fight with are not weapons of this world. Why? Because we're citizens of the kingdom. So therefore, our weapons are heavenly weapons. On the contrary, they have divine power. Watch this. This is a strong word. Demolish. Strongholds are those things, those places in people's minds that are locked down. So the book that uh, the, the ladies will be ringing, reading, it'll talk about this idea of strongholds, those things that it's hard for us to get past. He says the weapons that we fight with, the truth of the scripture, the power of the Holy Spirit, it says what? We have the power to demolish them. Fake facts. They say fear is what? False evidence appearing real. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And I like this one. And we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. He says you have runaway thoughts. Oh, this is going to happen. Oh, that's going to happen. You catastrophize it. Oh, oh. He's like, listen, grab that thought by the throat. He's like, hold up, throat. Hold up, uh, uh, thought. You have to obey what the Bible says. 
Anybody have runaway thoughts? Right? One thing happened, and now you're way over somewhere else. He said, grab that joke about a throat. You don't have to just let your thoughts run wild. You're supposed to control your thoughts, master your thoughts. Bring them under subjection. Take, and it says what? Every thought. Take all of your thinking. Anything that's crazy. Anything that doesn't sound like God. Anything that's misaligned with his word. You're going to die. No, I'm not. Nobody loves you. If nobody loves me, God loves me. And nobody else matters. Worst case scenario. You see what I'm saying? And so the devil will whisper in your ear and tell you all kinds of foolishness. Listen, thump that bad boy off your shoulder or something. <laughs> Take captive. One of the problems, that, one of the biggest problems, right, something happened, we let our minds run. But they hate that person doesn't even like me. They never liked me. They ain't like me since third grade. <laughs> and if they don't, so what? But maybe you should just sit down and have a conversation. I feel like, right? Not accused. I know you don't like me. That's not the way to start a conversation, P.S. <laughs> it's like, hey, I feel. And I could be wrong. I love that one. And I could be wrong. And I often am. You see that? I could be. I often am. But this is what I feel. Can we talk? Because if you roll up with me, I know you don't like me. You right. <laughs> and I like you less now. <laughs> Let's keep moving. Take captive. Take captive. Take captive. You have a, you, do you have a picture in your head? What's the picture, Ashley? Yeah, what's the picture? Yeah. <laughs> what, what does it mean to take captive? See, I, I, Go ahead. Tell me what you see. Yeah, stop, stop those negative things in their tracks. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Put some cuffs on them bad boys. Put a chain around their neck. Wrap them up. Right? Powerful. Let's keep going. Psalm 42 and 5. Watch this. Why, my soul, are you downcast? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my Savior and my God. You don't, you talk to yourself? <laughs> he say more than anybody else? <laughs> Not he's like, I love me some me. We talk all the time. <laughs> he's talking, he says, he's like, what's going on with you, soul? Why are you downcast? Why are you disturbed? You see the pep talk? Boy, put your, put your hope in God. I will yet praise him. I'll worship God. I'll trust him. I'll lean on him. He's the source. He's the one. He's God. So when your thoughts want to go after you choke them and throw them on the ground, then talk to yourself a little bit. Talk to them too. Now what? Get up. Put your hope in God. Number four, we exterminate our ants with the power of prayer. Popular passage, do not be anxious about anything. Listen, anxiety is a choice. We're not helpless. Now, it can overwhelm us. We can lose the fact that it is a choice. I'm, I get anxious. You get, it happens, but the point is, the word is saying, choose not to get anxious. Decide. But, big word, erase the anxiety and do what? In every situation. In every situation. In every situation. What we say a situation is. What is it? It's an offer. Opportunity for anxiety. 
in every situation, every opportunity for anxiety, pray. Ask God, petition, let him know what you want. Thank him. And I think I really understand this is, is retrospectively thanking him for what he's already done. Right? Back to Paul. You, he already did it. You remember the last time you were upset about this. You remember the last time you were anxious. The last time you were worried. He says, so with thanksgiving, thank him for what he's already done. Paul says, thank him for what he's going to do. And then thank you for what he's going to continue doing. Present your request to God. God, I thank you because I know you already take care of this because you did before. And you say in your word, you're going to continue to. And so I thank you in advance. And then it says some craziness happens. It says that peace of God. That transcends all understanding. Like, it don't make no sense. Why are you not worried? Why are you not upset? How are you in the hospital and you're not worried? How is it you haven't heard from the kid in an hour, two hours, three hours, and you're not tripping? How is it we got laid off and you're not screaming, hollering, laying on the floor with your thumb in your mouth? How can that be? It says what? The peace of God. That transcends all understanding. Why? Because you have automatic kingdom thoughts. Okay, God, you giving me an opportunity to do another thing. You're giving me an opportunity to work a better job. Something better than what I had is coming along. You're pushing me to get that business started. God, I thank you. And the peace that passes all understanding. It will set up guards. Your heart. Your emotions, your mind, your thinking, your thoughts, your feelings, your plans. And the peace of God will guard your hearts in King Jesus. Finally, number five, we adopt a strict mental diet. Carefully select our trainers and do our workout. Watch this. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true. Is noble, is right, is pure, is lovely, is admirable. Thank you for that. Mm -hmm. If anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Choose to think. A strict mental diet. If you eat a diet of candy, Hot Takis, fun <laughs> Funyuns, <laughs> and Coca-Cola. I'm not going to talk about Pepsi because I like Coca-Cola. You drink, I mean Pepsi. You eat that, drink that six days a week, two days a week, some of us. What will you be? <laughs> Obese? <laughs> Diabetical? Huh? You be depressed? You had a high, the sugar diabetes? The technical term, actually, what's the medical term for this? Um, bald up. You will be bald up. Because your diet, as they say, what you, you are what you eat, right? You will be sick. And all manner of illness will become your friend. If you do not have a good physical diet. And so he's saying, here's what to think about if you're confused. And so what, ask yourself, what is my diet? What is your mental diet? Are you filling your mind with nutrition, things that will give you energy, that will help you to lose spiritual and mental weight? to drop that stuff that you're carrying? Or are you eating things that are going to make you sick? Cause you aneurysms, right? I mean, you, you, you look at the television shows, like how to kill people and get away with it. <laughs> Why? I have uh, one, of my, one of my kids loves these like crime shows. 
and you know, try to sit and watch the show with the kids. I'm stressed out. At the, I'm like, I can't watch this. You know what I'm saying? Now I'm looking all outside. I'm looking at ads for security system. It says, safety is everything. I'm like, wow. Really? <laughs> so you need to have bars and lights. And people got all kind of cameras. and You know what I mean? Their phone is binging the whole time. They're everywhere. Oh, wait a minute. That's my, my doorbell. Hold on. <laughs> it's the mailman. What? What are we doing? There is no more crime today than before. <laughs> Even pre-cell phone. Anybody remember before cell phones? I know that some of you don't know. <laughs> there was a time before cell phones. Believe it or not. Back when dinosaurs roamed the earth. <laughs> and you couldn't track your kids or your spouse or your friend. Sometimes for days. Sometimes for weeks. I remember being in college. I call home maybe on Sunday, maybe. And guess what? I still here. I made it. But now, you forget that phone, or the kid don't have their phone. Oh my God. The world just ended. And what happens? The fear. Oh, what happens? To, what if? What if? What if? What if? What if? And the devil just feeding our stuff. Or you, or you consciously watch the news. You get up in the morning and watch the news. Are you kidding? Remember, that what, we're trying to go through the Bible together. What about if the first voice you heard was God? What if these verses we were reading was the first thing that you put in your mind? Not what's going to happen today, not what's wrong, not what happened overnight, not how bad the weather is going to be. Why the weather got to be a mission? Weather's going to do something today. <laughs> we'll tell you after this what these words. <laughs> I got a better one. Go outside. <laughs> if you get wet, it's raining. It's going to rain. <laughs> Boom. If anything is excellent. So the Bible says these are the things to think on. So ask yourself, litmus test your stuff. When you're listening to stuff, watching stuff, Paying attention to them, and people too. Amen. Ask, hmm, is that noble? Is it pure? Is it true? Is it lovely? Is that gossip somebody's talking to you about? Is that admirable? Is it excellent? Is it worthy of praise? This verse right here would totally transform our lives. Just this verse. If you said, I'm not going to consume anything that's not mentally healthy for me because I do not want to be spiritually balled up. Verse 9, whatever you've learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put into practice. Paul's like, follow me. He says, make me your trainer. Why? What happens? A trainer gives you accountability. They give you a program. They give you a plan. They tell you, they correct you when things are going wrong. And so he says, be in relationship and follow. That's why we have the, the group, the discipleship group. You have other believers who can give you insight. And, it's, and if you'll be honest, they can be like, you know what? That was foul. I don't know why my wife is mad at me. Because you're rude. How about that? I don't know why I got fired. Because you don't go to work. The devil made me lose my job. That and your attendance record. It says, whatever you've learned or received or heard or seen. Paul's like, listen, follow me. And as Christ follows, we have to be willing to say, follow me as I follow Christ. So that means we have to be mature enough and we have to be healthy enough. Some of us can't be followed because we ain't going nowhere. Say la. Pause and think about it. He says, and then when you do that, when you nutrition yourself properly, when you eat properly, when you select your trainers carefully, the people who you allow to speak into your life, the news that you allow people to bring you. And then he says, what, you do this, what does it say? And the God of peace will be with you.
God wants us to experience the abundant life. The abundant life begins in our minds. As citizens of the kingdom of God, the laws, the principles, the truths of the kingdom must permeate our thinking. And so more than anything, if I could get you and get us to trust God, to rely on his spirit, to seek to develop the mind of Christ. The Bible says we have access to it already. The question would be, That may mean we have to get rid of some things, some voices, some people. It may mean we have to wrestle with our natural way of thinking, those things that pop in our minds, and we're supposed to arrest them, captivate them, say, no, I'm not going to think that way. Why? Because it's misaligned with the truth of the word of God. Satan, I will no longer listen to your lies, the things that you tell me. truth of the scriptures. I want to have a kingdom mindset. And so today, if you're anxious, if you're worried, if you're nervous, I beg you, I plead you, go back and review the notes. Take those scriptures, pick one and just read it over and over like a vitamin. Like, let me take my vitamin and just review those passages this week. And anything that's misaligned with the truth of God's word, allow the spirit to correct that in your thinking. And if you have to stop social media, television, your friend next door, whatever it is you need to do to get your mind right and to have the mind of Christ, I encourage you to do that. I'm trying. I encourage you to do the same. Maybe there's somebody here, you've never surrendered your life to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. The most powerful thing that you can do is to surrender him, your life to him. Ask him to be your boss, the CEO of your life. That's step one to receiving his mindset. And even for those of us who are followers, sometimes we allow the enemy to distract us. And we get all upset and worried and shook up. God says, I want you to do better. I want you to have a better life than that than you can. So today, if if someone desires prayer, you want to accept Christ, you want prayer for your situations, your circumstances, things going on in your life, ask a couple of our prayer partners to come this morning. And if somebody wants prayer, ask that you would just come. We would love the opportunity to talk to God on your behalf. in the middle of something, you will be soon. That's just the way life works. But if we develop the mind of Christ, how we respond will be totally different. So please pray for yourself. Pray for those who are standing. Pray for me. Just
This opportunity, Lord God, to hear your word. God, I ask that it sinks deeply into our hearts and our minds. That God, our minds will be transformed and become the mind of Jesus Christ. Father, I thank you for this opportunity to pray. We thank you for our brothers and sisters, Lord God, who have come. Those who have unspoken requests, situations and circumstances of which we are not even aware of. God, I ask that you intervene powerfully on their behalf. Show yourself strong them, Lord God. Help them to reflect how you've come through for them in the past. Lord God, knowing that you'll come through in the present and you will continue to do so. And so God, we thank you. We praise you. We thank you, God, that our minds are being transformed as we have the mind of your son. We love you, God. We give you thanksgiving. We give you praise. We give you glory and honor. We pray this prayer in the name, the power, and the authority of Jesus Christ, our 